and uh, last week we were in Matthew chapter 5, we ended with verse number 20, now we're tackling verses 21 through 26, 21 through 26, and looking at Jesus now is teaching the teachers what the law uh, really means, and he's trying to express to them the erroneous um, position of the Pharisees and the scribes, and he's trying to teach his uh, followers uh, how to understand the law properly. And I think this happens to many of us too. Uh, how many of you have grown up in a church, whether it's this kind of church, any kind of, how many of you just grew up going to church when you're, since a child all the way up? You just, you're affiliated with church. Okay, that's the majority of the crowd that's here today. Um, but most of us when we went to church went because mom and dad told us to, or went because somebody was picking up to take you. And there came a point in a time where finally you said, I think I'm understanding what this church thing's all about. And then it came to a point where maybe you understood, man, it's more than just going to church. I need to have a relationship with the God of the church. How many remember coming to that point, that realization in your life? You finally said, okay, I need to have a relationship with God, not just go to church. Good. And uh, that's what all of us need to come to. We've taught our five boys, guys growing up, you're going to go because mom and dad are going. I'm a pastor. But you have to come to a point in your life sometime where you have to say, do I believe this stuff? Is this something that I really believe in my heart? And that was something that mom and I prayed about. Lord, we want them to understand it, but they have to receive it themselves. They can't just do it because dad's the pastor and mom and dad said so. That works while they're youth, but once they get to an age where they can make their own decisions, they've got to decide, why am I going to church? What is this all about? And that's when you hope that they truly do understand what the gospel is saying. They've trusted Christ their Savior. Now the Holy Spirit is given that compulsion to desire to go to church and live for God and honor God with their life. And so I think this is what we find here in this portion of Scripture as well. When Jesus was teaching His disciples, and no doubt there was a multitude that was following Him, but He also had scribes and Pharisees. These were the religious leaders of His day. Now, think of it this way. Say Jesus came on the scene today. I know it's hard for us to understand, but wrap your minds around it. Today is when Jesus shows up. And now he's teaching. So before he was crucified, now he's teaching. And we're the religious people of the day. How hard would it be for us to listen to this guy who is starting to make statements about him being the authority? How hard would it be for us to receive him? That'd be pretty tough, wouldn't it? You've got to put yourself back in the mindset of the people he's leading. Now they were seeing miracles, they were seeing perform things, and so they said, okay, this guy's different, we've never seen anybody do this kind of stuff. But then when he started teaching, for hundreds of years now, they've received the law of God a certain way. And they believed the Pharisees, who we would look at today as like the priests, some of you maybe, the Pope, the cardinals, the bishops, who were like, whoa, 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 if they said it, then it must be true, right? That's kind of the idea. The Pharisees were that, those kind of guys. They said it, well, it's got to be true. They know the law. They know what the Bible says. They, so we kind of just put it back in them, but... What happens is if you don't have a relationship with the God of the ordinances, of the laws, after a while, you get tired of doing it because there's no relationship. Remember I said last week, rules without a relationship does what? Breeds rebellion. After a while, you just get tired. You kind of just, you know what? You got all your rules, you got all your regulations, but there's no relationship with the person who's given the rules, then you get frustrated. And after a while, you don't want to do it. That happens in church. But that's a misunderstanding of what church is all about. See, church is not the building. Most of you know this, but the church are the individuals who have trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, now have the Spirit of God living in them. And then the Lord Jesus Christ said, I want you to meet together weekly to preach my doctrine and to educate people, to preach the gospel. I want you to have this time of encouraging each other. That's the church. We could do it here, we could do it at the city park, we could go down to the beach, we could go anywhere and have our church come together as long as we say, hey, we're committed to the doctrines of the Bible, we want to present Jesus Christ, we believe that in our heart. That's the church, it's the local body of believers, not the building. The building houses the church. And so a lot of times as people grow in their faith, they just don't, uh, or before they really grow in their faith, they don't quite understand, okay, yeah, we go to church. Well, why? Because we're supposed to. We're supposed to go to church. You could ask a kid that's going to school, why do you go to school? Because I, I have to. Well, why do you go to school? Because I have to. 
No, 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 there's more to it than that. Why are you going to school so I don't get in trouble at home? No, 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 there's more to it than that. Why are you going to school? Well, they want me to learn. Good. Now you're catching on. And so a kid's going to school not because he has to, because he gets to learn things for his future, so he has a better education, better opportunities at life. And we must understand that if people come to church because they have to, that won't last. Now, some people do it. They're just, they have character, they're faithful. They believe, though, that if they go to church, that somehow God's keeping a record of how many times they go to church. So when they get to heaven, he says, yep, you went to church a thousand and something times, come on in. But that's not said anywhere in our Bible. That's a works-based understanding of salvation. That's not a biblical understanding of salvation. So, you have to understand the mindset as Jesus is teaching, he's teaching and his disciples who are now following him are learning new concepts, but they're the right concepts. The Pharisees and the scribes who had the authority hate what they're hearing because it goes against their authority of what they were taught and what they were supposed to be doing. And so there's a rivalry, if you would. There's a disdain for Jesus Christ. But this is where we pick it up. He is teaching. And so we come to verse number 21 of Matthew chapter 5. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. And, whatsoever shall, uh, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever sh shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever, whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar and there rememberest, rem rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, Leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the ju judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, Thou shalt by no means come out thence, so the, thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Father, now with these words in our mind, would you please give me the liberty and the ability to explain this portion of Scripture. And Lord, may the application today, the takeaway, be something that every single one of us in here can understand. And may it be something we all work on. Because it's important for us to understand that you're teaching some valuable lessons about life and how we are to have a relationship with you first and foremost and then with others. And we'll ask now, Lord, for your guidance in Jesus' name. Amen. Notice what it says back in verse number 20, first of all. Verse number 20, it says, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into what? In heaven. So Jesus makes a statement, except your righteousness. Now, righteousness, we told you before, was... God's standard for what was right, here the idea is that if your good works, if the things that you uh, do spiritually do not exceed that of the Pharisees and the scribes, those were the religious leaders of the day. So looking at the religious leaders, there's no comparison for the common man. Well, I can't give myself to praying every day like these guys do. I can't go to the temple every day and offer. So I can't do what these... He was saying they're looking at the external... As they looked at the external, some of you may say that, well, you're the pastor. There's no way God looks at me the same way as he looks at you. You're, you're supposed to be the spiritual leader. You know, my life, I work a real job. I have to do this. I do this. There's no way we compare. And so you set up a standard that's lower for yourself than you do for the religious leaders. But that's not what God says at all. And what he is saying here is, He's putting them in a place where accept your righteousness, exceed their righteousness. So what's he doing? He's basically put them in a place where, well, that's impossible. They're dedicated their life to religion. How are we going to exceed their righteous works? And that's where he wanted them. They can't. And just because you're seeing these guys put on a show doesn't mean their heart is for me. They could just be going through the motions, as many religious leaders do today. So you never make comparison with a religious leader. 
That's, that's an error in your own heart and own mind. You're not comparing yourself with me. I'm not comparing myself with you or some other religious guru. I'm looking at what God's Word says to God. How do I compare to you? And how do I make sure that I'm right with you? And what are you saying is, if you're trying to do all the good works in order for you to be accepted in the kingdom of heaven, he said, it'll never be enough. You will never do enough to be accepted by God. Why? Because that's not how God accepts you. You're telling me, Pastor, if I come to church 52 weeks out of the year and you guys have three services, you have Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and a Wednesday night, and you have outreach, you have, if I came to everything, you're telling me that God would not accept me into heaven? No. Well, then you're just crazy. No, you've set a new standard. We do these things because they're opportunities for you to learn more about God. They're opportunities for you to grow in your faith. They're opportunities for you to come and be a part of the team and say, hey, how, what can we do for God? These, these are opportunities for you. But if you never trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, it means nothing. It means nothing. You're putting on a show. But if you are saved and you do those things, then yeah, God says there's rewards in heaven for those who serve me with a pure heart. But if you're coming and you're serving out of an impure heart, saying, I, I just want everyone to see me, God says, you've got your reward then. You're not getting them in heaven. You've got it here. You've got the attaboy from your friends. You've got the attaboy from your community. Wow, what a man of faith that guy is. He says, all right, you've got your reward. But not with him. So there's so much confusion amongst Christians today of what does it mean to be accepted by God? What you have to understand is, there was never this idea that we have, that even the Pharisees and the scribes turned it into. They made religion or they made the, uh, the level of commitment to God the standard now for which they were accepted by God. But that's not what God said. He gave us the law to show us that we were sinners and we were weak. That was to now say, okay, God, then what can I do to be saved? And he says, you trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I will then give you my righteousness and now the Spirit of God will be in you, and you'll start working those things out in time. It's a different mindset. And so we go back here then to verse number 21, and I want you to notice here, first of all, the expressed authority of Jesus, the expressed authority of Jesus. Notice what he says here in verse 1, and ye have heard that it was said by them of old time. And so right here, the Lord Jesus Christ is going back, and most likely he's quoting Moses and the prophets, He's saying, hey, you've heard it said of them of old times. Probably going all the way back to Mosaic Law, most likely you know, saying this about the prophets and some of the older leaders of the Jews. He's saying, you've heard it said of old time. And then he, he makes a statement here, uh, thou shalt not kill. Well, that was given by Moses. It was given by God, but Moses recorded it back in Exodus. And that was something they all believed in. But what we understand here is Jesus is expressing now his authority, he sets them up by saying, you've heard that it was said of old time, thou shalt not kill, but now he takes it to another level, and he says here in verse number uh, 22, but, what's the next word? But I. Now you have to understand something. If you're a Jewish leader, and you just quoted the Old Testament, and now you have someone standing in the position of the same authority, saying, but I say unto you, don't worry, they're not in hell, they're just having fun. The kids over there screaming, they're having a good time. They're not scaring them, they're playing and having, playing some games. <laughs> what Jesus is saying here, he says, now the authority shifts to me. And if the Pharisee was there, one of the scribes there hearing what he's saying, this was blasphemy. He just put himself on the level with the law. He just put him on himself on the level with Moses. He just put him on the same level with the prophets and with God. He said, but I. He is now self-proclaiming that he is the authority. You didn't do that back then. You understand? That was a big no-no. And he just put himself in the position of authority. As Moses, the scribes, the Pharisees, he says, but I say unto you. It's interesting that other places in the Bible, Matthew 7, verse 29 he spoke as one having authority, not as the scribes. Kind of interesting statement there. We'll get into that in a few weeks. Matthew 28, 18, when Jesus, Jesus was given what we call the Great Commission, he says, all power is given unto me. This is Jesus saying this. All authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. 
That's a blasphemous statement to those who are religious Jews. Who are you, Jesus? You're just a common man like us. No, he wasn't. He was 100% God and 100% man. He was sent divinely here to, in order to ultimately give his life a substitute for us. But they didn't understand. He was expressing the authority that he truly did have. He says, but I say unto you. And now when he says this, he's going back now to help them understand what was the original intent of the law. See, we can look at the laws and we say, well, the law says this, the law says this. Well, I guess you have to obey the law. Why, why do we obey the law? Why do we obey the law? Come on, somebody say it clearly. So we don't get punished. That's pretty much right. The only reason I obey some of the laws is because I don't want to go to jail. There are some laws I'd love to break. You're the pastor. Ooh. Yeah, hey, don't judge me. You know you do it. I can prove it. Last week we talked about speed limit on the highway. Yeah, raise your hand. You bet. Well, it's not technically speeding if I don't get caught. If there's no police around, I'm not really... I mean, we can go into all the different gray areas of the law. Well, they give you three to five miles over, but the law states 65 or 55 or 70, that's the, that's the stated law. Anything other than that, you violate a law. If you exceed the law, if you exceed the speed, right? You violate a law. I mean, we could say that's a stupid law. I don't, I don't, I don't agree with that. But it's the law. And so sometimes you look at the law and say, this, that's crazy. Now, if you really understood that the law saves lives, we look at it differently, don't we? Except for when we are late for something. We don't care. I've got to get there. So we make exceptions for ourselves. The problem is we can't do that with a righteous God. Well, just this time he'll understand. No, he doesn't understand just this time. Well, he knows that we're all sinners. Yes, he does, but there's no excuse for breaking the law. So you will be held accountable for what laws you break spiritually. So prior to salvation, it doesn't matter what you do that's good, that does not do anything for your eternal destination. After one trusts Christ as Savior, now you have a relationship with Christ, the Spirit of God comes inside, and now there should be a new desire there to please God. If there's not a desire there to please God, then you got a wrong salvation. You didn't get saved. The problem is sometimes after we've been saved for a while, we can slowly start drifting back into the old sins, and we stop being convicted by the Holy Spirit. We can think that we're not saved. We've forgotten that we're purged from our old sins because we've dabbled so much now into the ungodly stuff that we don't know what it's like to sense the convicting of the Holy Spirit any longer. So there's a danger for us, but it doesn't mean that you're going to die and go to hell if you're truly saved, but why would you want to displease God as now one of his followers? So we have the expressed authority of Jesus. We see this in verse number 21 and 22. Now I want you to notice the external performance of the religious. And this is kind of what we had talked about here. The scribes represented and the Pharisees represented everything that was considered right in the Jewish religion. They were the standard for what was right. They taught the law. They expressed it. But they took the law farther than it was supposed to go. They came with all kinds of little laws on top of the law in order to get the people to obey more and more laws. It was wrong, but they did it. And because they were religious leaders, people had to follow. And so what happened here was that the scribes and the Pharisees now were the standard, but you also must understand what happens with them. They, when they kept coming up with these laws, they knew they were not from God. So they, on the external, would only obey the laws that they knew were for God, but they made everyone else obey all the little laws. How would you like to have that as a leader? And so all the little laws they came up with, they only did them if, the, if, if it was public, so that way people would keep trying to obey these laws. And so what took place was people started getting disheartened, and, and obviously they became the standard of what was right. But they, they dressed a certain way to show others their supposed dedication to God. And they said, if, if, if you want to see what the right example of, of spirituality is, look at us. If you want to understand what the spiritual lifestyle should be, follow us. 
And so everything now was not so much on God, it was on the religious leaders, which then people started saying, there's no way we can be as spiritual then because we, we just can't live like they do. And so it brought a lot of disheartening to the, the people. Let me make this statement to you. Relational righteousness is more important than ritual righteousness. Relational righteousness, meaning being right with God, first by salvation, secondly by living a life that honors Him. Relational righteousness is more important than ritual righteousness. As I've said this before, you can come to church every service we have. You can go out and do all the service in the community. You can give your tithes and offerings. You can do 50%. You can do all this. But your heart could be hardened and your, your, your life could be a mess spiritually. But you think because you do all these good things that God's going to accept you. And that's not true. That's, that's being a religious Pharisee. And that's what they were doing. And so the people were disheartened with the laws. And so we find that the laws, the law states, thou shalt not kill. Notice what Jesus said here in verse 22. But I say unto you that whosoever is, what? Angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Jesus just said, now you say, thou shalt not kill, which is correct. But Jesus says, if you get angry with your brethren, you're in danger of the judgment. He just now elevated the law back to its rightful place. Say, how did he elevate the law? When the law was originally given back in Exodus, what we find is that God desired that the law would be written on the inward part of their heart. He wanted it to be a part of their life, not something they had to look at this list, say, okay, we have to do this, we can't do this, we can't do this, we can't do this, we can't do this. He said, no, 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 I want it to be a part of your heart. The scriptures tell us that someday, Isaiah tells us someday the, that the laws will be written on the hearts of men. We notice another portion of scripture where it calls all those that um, uh, live a life of, uh, that has been saved and dedicated, we have become spiritual through spiritual circumcision. We have given our life now to Christ. And through that, His laws are now a part of our life. As I mentioned a couple of weeks ago with this idea, and I think last week I hit on it, the idea of the law of love surpasses the Ten Commandments. It doesn't do away with them, but because I love God, I'm not going to murder somebody. So the love, God said the law of love is higher than the, the law of, of uh, statutes because the law of love says, I will treat my brother with respect. If he makes me mad, I'm willing to get it right, right away. So that way it doesn't linger, it doesn't fester. And so God says the law of love is higher. And so he commanded us in Matthew chapter tw uh, uh, 22, he talks about in 36 through 39 there, the first and great commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. The second, love thy neighbor as thyself. And for any of you that have tried that, that's harder. That is so much harder to think about my neighbor, think about my friends, think about others just as much as I think about myself. No, we're selfish people. I think about myself way more than I think about others. This morning when I woke up and it was cold, it was cold out, and I'm thinking, I don't want to get out of this bed. But I've got to finish up my message, and I've got to pray for a little while, and I've got to get my heart ready to, to preach to people. And I'm thinking, and every, when you get out of bed, I mean, every time you take a step, I heard cracking and crinkling, and thought it was the wood floor, but it was my legs. <laughs> thinking, this is just nuts. Who would want to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning to go to church, you know, in a few hours? And, but that's... You know, when we, based on selfish desires, I mean, most of us wouldn't want to do anything for someone else except it brought us something in return. And so we must understand that the laws that are given and the laws that they were uh, having to go by, Jesus is now elevating back the law back to its rightful position to the heart. He said, you have been taught so long by the Pharisees and the scribes, all these laws that have now torn down and torn down the original intent. The original intent of the Lord was that you, uh, law was love God. Love Him with your heart. And you'll have no problem obeying these laws. But when you don't love God, man, those laws seem like a burden. Why should I do that? 
You're taking away my fun. You're taking away my joy. You're taking away my life. No, but when you love somebody, you do it because it's the right thing to do and you don't have a problem doing it. The next point I want to bring to you is the exalted principle of the law, the exalted principle of the law. So we had the expressed authority of Jesus, the external performance of the religious, and now the exalted principle of the law. So he exalts the law back to its rightful place. He, didn't, he, he took the idea of kill and put anger right next to it. Now most of us in here, you say, your people say, well, I've never broken any of the Ten Commandments. Liar. But you must understand that even if you've been angry, according to Jesus Christ, it's as bad as murder. Now, that doesn't give you an excuse. Say, well, I'm already angry. Might as well kill him. Don't do that. Okay, there is different consequences, okay? <laughs> I'm not giving permission. Repeat, repeat. Not giving permission to kill. Exalted principle of the law. The, Jesus took it back to its rightful place, and he says, I want to talk to your heart. Not just the obedience. Well, if I go to church, if I get baptized, if I light the candles, if I do all these religious stuff, then God will accept me. No, 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 no. He says, I want your heart. And if you do those things, wonderful. That's great if you want to express your love to me by doing those things. But your heart first must be converted. And so what we find here is that he says, thou shalt not kill. We get that. But don't be angry. Don't insult someone when they've offended me. Don't wish them harm. I mean, come on. There's been people that have wronged me. I'm sure it's happened to you. And I could see me decking them. I mean, I could just revel in the fact that, man, I could knock this person out right now. This would feel so good for a moment. When you get angry, all kinds of stuff come up inside your heart and your mind. And that God knew that about us. And he says, and the anger is the next step to murder. But the anger, he says, he put on the same level. He said, if you're angry, he said, I look at it as murder. And what he says back very in verse number 22, but I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And so anger now is elevated to the same idea as murder. Anger will result in judgment just as well as murder will result in judgment. The idea of the word raka here, this is, it's kind of more of, a, of an expression than it is an actual uh, word, but the, word, the idea of the word raka here is, uh, has the idea of a contempt, a vile insult against someone's character. And here, if you were accused of something and your anger uh, was elevated and you said raka, to someone, uh, some type of an insult that would de demean their character, slander, I guess, the best way we could understand in our day, you'd be in danger then of having to go before the council. The council was the Sanhedrin. They were the ruling body that would listen to and make judgments. There were judges that sat in the city gates, and there was the Sanhedrin. But then notice what it says here in, in the latter portion. If you say, thou fool, you should be in danger of hellfire. And I'll, um, if I have the time, I'll get to this in the conclusion. But outside of the city gates of Jerusalem was a place called Gehenna. It was also Hinnom, the Valley of Hinnom, where they burned their trash. Hundreds of years before this time where Jesus was speaking, it was an actual place where they would offer up. It was like the place they would offer up child sacrifices. Yeah, pretty vile. The children of Israel actually started participating in it. That's why God judged them so severely. You say, you see, yeah, go back and read your history. It's amazing the stuff that these people got into. And at the same time, they still say, why would God be mad at us? We still have his temple. And that's the way many Christians are today. Why would God be mad at me? So I go and do my own thing, but I go to church on Sunday. Are you serious? What God do you think you're serving? That's why he finally brought judgment to Jerusalem. So the idea of thou fool is showing 
again, more contempt for someone who has the authority to, to bring you under charges and you call him a fool. And he says, oh, you're going to see who the fool is. You keep that attitude up, you're going to go to hell. After they take you to prison and you die in prison, they throw your body out in that trash heap and you're just going to keep burning. And it was an allusion to an eternal hell. And Jesus is using this as an illustration to them that you say that those who murder will go to hell someday. He says, I'm telling you, those who are angry eventually will also go to hell. It's kind of an interesting way he's explaining it here. And so we have to take it very seriously as Christians. Jesus puts murder and anger on the same level. But anger arises when we sense our rules have been violated. If you really sit back and study why you're angry, you say, well, so-and-so do this to me, so-and-so, okay. But it really comes down to, I was violated, therefore I feel justified in being mad. Because they hurt my pride, they hurt me, my self-esteem, they hurt whatever, you, whatever excuse you want to come to, Jesus says, no, it's sin. That's why we need him even more so. Because naturally inside of fleshly human, we have pride and, and we don't want people messing with us. And if somebody messes with us too much, we want to fight it, we want to lash out, we want to verbally attack. We want to... That's the sin that's embedded in all of us. That's why Jesus knew we needed a Savior. But what happens is when we do not deal with that anger in a proper way, what we're doing is we're putting ourselves above others, and when that is attacked, we feel like they can't attack us, so we attack back. And so the idea of, I don't deserve that, so I have the right to be angry. Listen to this. Unresolved anger leads to a multitude of sins. Bitterness, wrath, striking out, scheming, rage, uncontrolled spirit, self-hatred, and eventually death. Anger leads to that. Jesus knew what he was talking about, don't you think, just a little bit? And he was trying to help people with the idea that you think murder is the only thing I'm against. No, he said at the heart of the matter is anger. You don't murder for no reason. You murder because you're mad. You murder because you're angry. You murder because someone didn't do what you, uh, 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 what you thought they should do. And so you got angry and that led to murder. You see, when you get to the heart of the matter, that's when you can start find healing. But if you deal with the surface thing, and that's exactly what the Pharisees were doing, thou should not kill. Okay, but you can scheme and you can plot and you can be mean and you can be angry and you can get back at them, but you can't kill them, okay? And Jesus said, no, 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 you're misunderstanding. Anger is just as much of a sin because it results in murder. And so we have in Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 26, a statement that confuses most of us. Be angry and sin not. Well, didn't Jesus flip over the tables of the temple? Yes, in righteous indignation. He didn't kill them. But as God, he had every right to, but he didn't kill them. He was showing them that you're making my, my house a den of thieves, and he was mad. doesn't mean we can't get angry when someone sins against us. It doesn't mean that we can't be upset if someone violates us, but it does mean what's the extent of that. We should be willing to seek reconciliation and make things right, but not hurt them. It's a totally different way of thinking, and that only comes from the Spirit of God. It doesn't come from us. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon thy wrath. That's how quickly you should deal with it if you're angry. Listen, I've been in the ministry over 20 years. I've had all kinds of scenarios from all the different ministries I've been in. I have had someone come to me one time and said, Pastor, I couldn't talk to you. It's been several weeks, and I've just been stewing this. I mean, several weeks I've been mad at you. And I was thinking, you've been mad at me for how several weeks? I couldn't talk to you. Like, okay. Well, I had no idea. And if I told you the situation, you, you would laugh. There was nothing that I did. It was just a personal thing. And, but they were mad at me. I'm thinking, do I apologize just to apologize? Or what do I say here? I'm thinking, how do I deal with this? But those are things, sometimes people harbor things, and they harbor things. And I said, let me ask you one question. I said, for the three weeks you've been mad at me, how have you slept? I haven't slept very well at all. How's your relationship been with your spouse? Not good at all. How about the kids? Yeah, everyone knows something's wrong right with dad. How's work going? Not good. 
and say, in the three weeks that you kept your anger against me, who did it hurt? Me, themselves. See, that's what anger does. We, we want to get worked up, but man, we can plot, we can scheme. It's hurting us, and there's studies out there that tell us that anger creates anxiety, which hurts us physically. That's why there's so many different types of sicknesses. Not all, but there are some sicknesses that are associated with anxiety and anger and rage. And people are hurting themselves, thinking they're justified in being mad at whoever it might be. And they're hurting themselves, and God knew that. He says, it's much better for you to get it right right away so you can sleep well at night. Isn't it better to gain a friend back than to have an enemy now for the rest of your life? There's a lot of common sense in it. But the pride, the proud person says, mm -mm. no way, ain't going to happen. The only way I'll talk to that person, they come back on their knees groveling. Well, what if they didn't know like I didn't know? You're going to be waiting a long time. You say, well, they know. Okay, maybe they don't know how to approach you. 1 John chapter 3, verse number 15. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, God said it. He used the apostle John. If you hate your brother, you are a murderer. 1 John 3, 15. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Notice the last point. The expectation of the righteous, verses 23 through 26. Here's Jesus' expectation of all those who are angry, all those who are offended. Here's the expectation. So he goes from stating the law of murder, thou shalt not kill. He makes it equal now with anger. Whether you're angry or you commit murder, it's the same thing in the eyes of God. Another level. But he says, I want to deal with your heart not just the external law. There's too many people faking it as Christians. There's too many faking it as Jews. They're just going by what the law says. And All right, have I done enough All right, to make you happy, Pharisee? Yep, okay, go on your way. You haven't made God happy. You may fake the pastor out. You may fake out your religious leader. You may fake out him. Great. But God is the one you're going to answer to, not us. The expectation of the righteous, verses 23 through 26. Notice what it says in verse 23. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar. So after he's just now said, anger is just as bad as murder, and those who uh, are angry at their brother without a cause are danger of the judgment, the counsel, hellfire eventually. He says now, therefore, and anytime you see a therefore in the Bible, you go back to see what it's there for. That's a very simple statement. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, you say, what's he talking about? The Jews would go and they would take their offerings to the temple to give their offerings unto the priests. And when you're going to take your offering to the priest, he says, if you remember on your way to church that you've offended another brother in Christ, another sister in Christ, or it might not even be a saved person, doesn't matter who it is, you offended somebody, you remember it. He says, stop. Go back and make it right. Say, wait a minute, God's telling us not to go to church? <laughs> yeah, for a purpose. Get things right. Because you can come and sing the songs, you can come and pray the prayers, you could even come and teach a Sunday school class, you can come and be the pastor of the church, and if you have anger or bitterness, God says, I see none of it until you get it right. What? Yeah. He doesn't accept any of it until he sees that you've made it right. So we have other portions of Scripture. Matthew 18, verse number 15, very fitting for this. Matthew 18, verse number 15 through 17. Notice what it says here. This is very uncomfortable for a lot of people, but it's very necessary. Jesus knew that mankind would have problems with each other. In Matthew chapter 18, verse number 15, it says this, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee. So the offended one, the one who is offended by another brother or sister in Christ, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault. You say, oh yeah, you better believe it. I'm going to go and tell them what a rotten, dirty scoundrel they are, what they did to me, hurt me so bad, I'm going to let them have it. 
And before I go there, I'm going to tell all my friends and all the other church members how wicked that person is and what they're really like. Well, you better read the rest of this verse first. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him. How so? Alone. He didn't say take a poll. He didn't say ask all the people in the church what they think. And No, he says you go to them alone. Why? Because sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes we make more of it than what it really is. But you know what people want to do when they feel like you've been offended? They want to side. They want to pick a side. It's like a wife who goes to her husband and says, honey, just hear me out on this. I want to talk to you about some things I need. And the husband immediately is thinking, okay, we could do this, we could do this, we could do this. She goes, look, I just want you to listen. I don't want you to fix anything. Just listen to me. And sometimes that's what happens when we go and we gossip to somebody else about another person. Now you drag that person into it as well. And now this person is thinking negative. But they haven't heard the other side. As, as sweet and as honest and as nice as you are, there's also the other person has another side to it. And no one, only, only a foolish person would give advice only hearing one side. You have to listen to both sides. And so what we find here in verse number 15 of Matthew 18, go to that person alone, make it right. And if they, if they hear thee, the meaning they understood, it might be you go to them and say, look, you offended me, and I'm, I'm trying to be as kind as I can, but you really hurt my feelings, you really did this. And they might say, you know what, I am so sorry. I blew it, you're right, I messed up. Would you forgive me? And you've gained now your brother or sister back in friendship. They may say, yeah, and I meant it. Okay, well, that's not good. Or they may say, I meant it, but I'm sorry now. And there's so many different ways this could be handled. So whatever the case is, if it doesn't get resolved, then the next step. But if he will not hear thee, then take with them one or two more. That in the mouth of two or three witnesses, this was a custom of that day. If you're going to take someone to court... You had to have two or three witnesses to bear a record. But this is not talking about legal, the court system is talking about individually. That every word may be established. So now we're taking it to the next level. And anyone that would come to somebody else with an issue, and now you have two or three other people with you as witnesses, you say, okay, this is seri more serious than I thought, I guess. And now they sit there as witnesses, listen to the conversation, listen to both sides. Can we make this thing right now? Yeah, you know, we better make this right. Okay, good. And everyone needs to have a, the ability to have amnesia. You walk out of the room, it was resolved, let's forget about it, let's move on with life. If it doesn't work that way, then it says take them before the whole church. Ouch. Ouch. But you know what's happened here? Has it happened here? Yeah. You know what happens? They usually say, well, I'm out of here. I'm not doing that. So you're willing to leave instead of making this right? Yep. Why would you do that? It's not just here. It's, you're, you're losing a brother or sister. You're violating what God said, not what the church is saying. You're violating what God said. Why wouldn't you want to make this right? I don't like them. Okay, but don't you see where you have to make this right with, with this person? Don't want to. And we've had people leave the church over stuff like this. It's not right. Their prayers are hindered. Their spiritual walk is hindered. Now, there's peace. They say, oh, I have so much peace since I'm gone now. I'm at another church. We're doing great. There's peace because they haven't settled the issue. They're not around the person they have the issue with. But as soon as they're around that person again, they won't be peace. There won't be peace. And how many mountains are you going to climb so you can find peace? The expectation of the righteous. The righteous are expected to make things right with others if it's within their power. And so, the answer to anger is reconciliation. Reconciling, uh, reconciliation is Jesus' command in this text. Back in our, in our main text, Matthew chapter 5. Leave thy gift there before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled. Jesus said your reconciliation to another brother and sister Christ is more important than your tithes and offerings. It's more important you coming and participating in your ministry. He says make it right first. Reconciliation precedes worship, prayer, and service. 
Mark chapter 11, verse 25, And when ye stand praying, forgive, if ye have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you. Do you realize that God holds you accountable for not forgiving someone else? Now, I realize we live in a day and age where there's a lot that people have to work through. Some hard, harsh things happen to some people. And you may need counseling and help to get through some things, but you need to understand that God wants you to be willing to forgive as He has forgiven you. In conclusion, verse 22 gives us the illusion, if you would, to hell which is a terrifying reality to those who do not believe in Jesus as their personal Savior. This speaks of the garbage dump in the Valley of Hinnom, as I mentioned earlier, that burned constantly. And Jesus was warning all those that are not saved that eventually that will be the place of eternal judgment. He was saying, based on the law of that day, if they would not reconcile, if they had anger in their heart, they'd go before the councils, they refused, they refused, they said, you guys are crazy, you're foolish. He said, eventually, the, the person would die in prison and be cast into that valley of where they'd just burn forever. He said, it's an allusion to an eternity in hell for those who do not trust Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Let me ask you a question. Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Do you claim to be one of His children? If so, then praise God. Praise God. That's awesome. But if you haven't, this illusion is what awaits those who do not trust Christ as their Savior. All the good works, all the good deeds, all the religious things you want to do, they don't get you to heaven. It's faith in what Jesus Christ did for you on that cross. He died in your place. He paid your debt. He wants you to receive Him. And then after you get saved, that's when the good works come into play. He says, yeah, for every good work you do with a pure heart, you got rewards in heaven. I don't even know what heaven's going to look like for most of us. It could be awesome. It could be, it could be warehouses full of gifts when you get to heaven. How would that be? I personally don't think we're going to care. But at the same time, God said he's keeping record after we get saved. And so let me ask you this. As a believer... Anger only hurts you. Now, you can use it to hurt others, but it hurts you mostly. And some of you in here may have to reconcile with a brother or sister in Christ. Maybe in this church, maybe outside of this church, might even be family members. But for you to refuse to get things right, according to the Scriptures, that is sin. And God says your anger and the bitterness that comes from that and the unresolved conflicts that come, will result in you not having your prayers heard, not having your spirit ministered to. And I've seen this in churches many times. Eventually, the people get cold spiritually. They don't understand why they're not getting some of the Bible. They say, I don't get anything out of the preaching. Oh, there's all kinds of things that this starts turning into. And they want to blame everybody else except for themselves for not reconciling issues first with someone else, then with God. Don't be that kind of person. It's so much better to be embarrassed, get it right, get it over with, and